game or you deal with my father And he call me great Great, great Nothing you can say will equate Crowd surfing caught a wave I ain't stopping till they put me in the grave Dreaming like I'm big and paid Living like we be in J We don't care what people say, we know Ain't nobody gave me nothing no. We call it bless, you call it stun Ain't lying, I'ma keep it 100 yeah. Everything I got, it came from the father in it Good, yeah, good, he so good, yeah, good He be good, yeah, good, he so good Oh yeah, he so, he so Look, walking with my God, I never go back All these losses turning into lessons, but you know that Satan can't only be under my feet like a doormat We keep getting blessings, why them haters be so mad? Hey, why you bringing up my pad like it's Thursday? I am just a product of his grace and his mercy Knew me in the womb, I've been ready since my birthday Got kids, so I'm getting to the green like it's Earth Day They say they rich, we rich, rich, rich in this love and the scripture I had to paint him a bitch, he paid the price and I'm fishing Nobody gave me nothing. We call it bless. You call it stun. Ain't lying. I'ma keep it 100. Yeah. Everything I got, it came from the Father. Any good? Yeah. Good. He's so good. Yeah. Good. He be good. Yeah. Good. He's so good. Yeah. He's so. He's so. And he call me great. 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 Nothing you can say will equate. Crowd surfing caught a wave. I ain't stopping till they put me in the grave. And he called me great. Great, great. Nothing you can say will equate. Crowd surfing caught a wave. I ain't stopping till they put me in the grave. Ain't nobody gave me nothing. No, we call it bless. You call it stun. I ain't lying, I'ma keep it 100. Yeah. Everything I got, it came from the father, any. Good, yeah, good. He's so good, yeah, good. He be good, yeah, good. He's so good, yeah. He's so, he's so good. is a good guy,
another edition of the Rashad Mills Show here on Awesome God Radio. Thank you so much for making a space in your heart and in your schedule to be with me every Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, because without you, quite frankly, I don't even exist. So let's do one quick housekeeping matter, and that's simply to do this. Go ahead and download the Awesome God Radio app. That app is available if you are team Android, team iPhone. It doesn't matter. Go ahead and download that app. That way you can stay abreast of everything that Awesome God Radio is doing throughout the course of the week, not just the Rashad Mill Show, the music and other quality content. And again, I appreciate you for everything that you have done and continue to do. Super producer James is going to do an amazing job this evening. He's going to put the call in number. So that way, if you have some questions for my amazing guest, what I'll introduce momentarily, you'll have access to him. So my guest. My main man, um, a licensed loan originator, a licensed realtor, an actor, <laughs> an author from Prison of Paradise. My main man, Alan Upshaw, how are you? Absolutely. I, I, I actually, throughout the course of this week, what I told people about the interview, it was going to be motivational. In addition to that, it was going to be informational. And I know that's something that you're going to bring to the Rashad Mill Show. So out of all of those titles, does any title resonate with you a little more than the other one? Wow, that's tough to say. Uh, I would definitely say author. Mm -hmm. Why author? Author author to me, uh, I think out of all of it means the most to me is because um, I left something behind that I felt that I can still leave a blueprint. You know, the books that I leave behind even after I die, you know, my offspring or friends, family, legacy, generations can have that in writing. Mm -hmm. You know, that evidence is still stated. You know, having a a real estate license, you know, I did help create homeowners with that or help fund with being a loan originator, but the evidence, you know, being an author, you leave the evidence behind for the next generation. You know, you leave that blueprint. So, I think out of all of them, me being an author, you know, probably has the most meaning behind it. Well, speaking of an author, that's the perfect segue. So one of the ways that I was introduced to you is by my great brother, Will Rogers. And he said that he's an author. And you'll probably connect with him because you have an amazing story. You are author of, actually working on being a two-time author. But this first book is called From Prison to Paradise, right? And this is a short but very powerful, very, very powerful read. And before we get into everything that you're doing in terms of real estate, tell people how you got to the point of actually being in prison. So, I actually went been to prison two times, mm-hmm. and the first time was I was at Bowie State University. I was a bio major. Mm-hmm. You know, love science. I'm always been fascinated by how things heal. Mm-hmm. And as I go further on, and we go further into this interview, I'll explain how that crazy came back around. But science was always my big passion. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go to school to be a chiropractor because one of the things I believed in was helping the body heal without the use of medication. Okay. So that was why I ultimately went to school for at Bowie State University. Now, when I was at Bowie, you know, academics, I love that aspect. But, mm-hmm. you know, me being young, I'm away from my, you know, from my parents. Uh, you know, it was a uh, winter break. Winter break, i never forget it. I was with my friends and, you know, I was going around robbing people. Mm-hmm. You know, it caught up to me. One of the robberies that I performed, I thought I got away with. I went back on campus. i never forget it was Valentine's Day. Police came, locked me up, boom. Now I'm faced with a, a robbery. Uh, even when I got charged with that robbery, it was a $100,000 bond at the time. Uh, they actually, I actually did bail out. And when I bailed out, I was like, you know, I got a court date coming up. You know, let me, at the time, crazy, I tried to get my real estate license to have like a good story for the judge on why I should get away with this. I actually failed and didn't take it again. Mm-hmm. Got a little job uh, and pretty much just trying to have some stability so when I went in front of the judge for that trial, did not make it seem as bad. Long story short, the judge wasn't trying to hear it. First, my first sentence, they gave me three years. It was a felony and I ended up doing 18 and a half months in there. Mm-hmm. So that was the beginning of, you know, me being in prison. And even during that time in prison, the big thing that I would tell myself was, look, I just need to get out of here. You know, it was like, yeah, I knew that I was in prison. Yeah, I knew it was a place I didn't want to be from where I was. It was more that I was disappointed that I was in college and this opportunity of me being in college. I felt bad about it. But then after I overcame that, it was just a matter of I just want to get out. Mm-hmm. You know, that was my whole focus. I wasn't really looking at the lessons that needed to be learned at the time. It was just, man, I'm just trying to get out of here. So I really wasn't taking the time to really educate myself. I was just mm-hmm. going through the motions. I'm, I'm 19 years old at the time. You know, uh, it was just like something that I just needed to get over as a hump. And that was simply it. 
So when you walked out after that first prison stint, it, mm-hmm. it doesn't sound like that there was any element of being reformed in Allen. It was like, I'm out of here, I'm gone, and I'm kind of doing my thing as, again. So so there were times, you know, I was in boot camp, and you know, at the boot camp stage, it was about discipline and mm-hmm. honing in. So really what it did was it kept me physically fit throughout me being in prison. And it just like it happened so fast, you know. Um, there were moments where I felt like, yeah, I don't want to go back again. You have your moments where it's down days and you mm-hmm. want to be home. And it's like, yeah, man, I don't want to be here no more, man. I ain't doing that again. And I actually told myself I wasn't going to rob no more. And I didn't. Mm-hmm. So I did learn in that aspect. But not overall change in the Got sense you. of like, don't break law no more. Find a better way. Make better use of your time. It was just, man, I ain't robbing nobody no more. So it was like that small aspect of my life changed. As me being as reckless, all it pretty much did was make me think, like, if I do break law again, I got to be smarter about it. As mm-hmm. opposed okay. to, like, don't break law at all. Do it a better way. So all it did was just make me be more creative because I had the time to be. Let me do this in a different way. Got you. So kind of tell us, you get out, and then where where are you before you go back in again? I actually made it a priority to go right back to school. Mm-hmm. So one thing I did leave was, even though I was in prison the first time, I was an avid reader. Like, I loved to read. Um, ever since I was a kid, I loved to read. So during that time in prison, I did love to read to let time go by. But even then, the books that I read the first go around were more like, novels you know uh still science but not so much self-help not so much like when i get out of here let me read something to put myself in a position to be better those type of books i wasn't reading on my first okay it was more so read to pass the time more than anything um so going back i actually made a priority to go back to college and even this time around i was at university of maryland eastern shore this time and i was in the honors dorm i wrote a letter and let them know you know, uh, what my grades were before I went to prison. I actually talked to the president. I went the extra mile to get back in school. And I actually got back in, and they put me in an honors dorm room. When I was in the honors dorm room, that first semester started off strong. Mm-hmm. But then the next semester, it was like, uh, the people I'm in this honors dorm room, they kind of weird, nerds. You know, I'm thinking crazy again. <laughs> so it was like, even though I kind of, in a sense, was one too, but how they were, it was just a little different. So uh, like you were a much cooler nerd. Yeah, yeah. But like that. Yeah, yeah. right. Gotcha. So so I went back. So I went back to uh, I went to a different dorm. Now I'm in the clusters area. So the clusters is more like it more is more stuff going down. You know, you it's more the element, more weed smoking, drinking, mm-hmm. partying, girls. You know, so I'm like, all right, I can okay. I can dig this. You know, so I got introduced to selling drugs. So I'm like, man, you know, my pocket's kind of empty. You know, I'm not hurting nobody. That was my thing. I was like, well, I'm not hurting nobody. I'm just selling drugs. So I started getting good at it. I started making a good amount of money. Started mm-hmm. making a name for myself. I'm like, well, this, this ain't bad. So I was a guy in college where I had the good grades. I was passing all my tests. You know, I even had times where I was teaching some of my classes when a teacher wasn't there. They would actually let wow. me teach the class. Um, at a, Again, exercise science major because I love science. All uh, 206 bones, all uh, 684 muscles of the body. Like, I love science. So, I was the guy by day that was in the classroom. But at nighttime, I'm selling pounds of weed at Salisbury, Ocean City. Like, I'm moving work. Now, like anything, it catches up to you. Mm-hmm. God, ironically in life, what happened was when I used to be a robber. There were a string of robberies that were happening on campus. And I'll be like, man, I wish somebody would rob me. I don't know how many times I said that, at least maybe 200 times. Because all within like a 60-day period, you would hear about a string of robberies. And I'd be like, damn, people getting robbed on campus? Like, where is this happening at? So let me jump in and just ask you a quick question. Why did you say, I wish somebody would rob me? Was that your mind saying, look, I'm from the streets and I dare somebody to test me? Or I'm Um, curious as how you got there. Well, part of it, I've always been pugnacious since I've been a child. Like, I've always been fond of fighting. I love to fight. Mm -hmm. So it was always like the aspect, like, if somebody's trying to rob me, I would be quick to be confrontational. So that was part of it. Again, what you said was part of it. And then it was like, I used to be a robber. So I'm not going to let somebody just rob me. You know, you. So that was the other part. I went to prison for robbing. So I'm not going to let you. So just you come. almost. In essence, and I'm in almost, college. Yeah. You almost, so it was in like, essence, would have felt disrespected if somebody tried to rob the robber. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And it's just gotcha. like, man, we in college, man. Like, you're going to just come up to me and rob. We in college students, man. You know? So, ironically, ironically, early morning, I would never leave out the house 
with, if it wasn't a certain amount. So it was a small amount that morning. And somebody kept hitting my phone, like, constantly for some work. And I'm like, I ain't think nothing of it, so I'm leaving out. And they call again. I'm like, man, I'm about to be there. Light bulb flash. Like, this might be that moment where somebody's trying to rob me. Now, I really want to be there. I really want to see if this person really about to do this to me. So all of this process in your mind prior to actually going out. Yeah, like I felt, wow. I felt it coming. It was like I felt like this wasn't right. Like you just called me three minutes ago and I said I'm on my way. And then you calling me again like, man, where you at? Where you at? So it's like you rushing me for this small amount of work. So in my mind, I'm like you're trying to get half, basically. And long enough, I actually went with two of my roommates. And I was in the back seat. Gave the guy to work. It's two of them. One on ones. The other guy stays. When the guy stays, man, I get out the car. I got a knife in my hand at this mm -hmm. point. The guy puts a gun to my head. The gun jams. He runs. Make a long story short, I stab him. Boom. Thought I got away. Two hours later, SWAT team comes. Boom. Now they saying you charge. At the time, they thought he was going to die because I stabbed him. I missed his heart by three millimeters. Wow. Yeah. So, um, basically, they were saying that it's, it's about to be a murder case. It's, they got two of us. Because when we was in the car leaving out, the SWAT team got on both of us. You know the rules of the streets. Mm -hmm. Don't say nothing. And you deal with it how you deal with it. I didn't say anything. But come to find out, my partner did. Told all on me. He told the police everything from... They, we left out originally at 8, 10 in the morning. We went to full line that morning. We got bacon and eggs. He said all of that in the report. So it looked ugly. It was an ugly case, man. They didn't have no statement from me. The guy ended up surviving. He had a statement. So you got my partner who was in the car saying that I did it. Saying that he didn't see the knife actually go in, but he came back in the car with a bloody knife. And I seen the guy laid out to the guy who actually got stabbed saying that I did it. Ugly case, man. So I got charged with first degree attempt, second degree attempt, first degree assault, second degree assault, reckless endangerment, and dangerous weapon with intent to injure. So let me just jump in and ask this very critical question. What yep. was your thought process at that point? Now, you have a massive amount of charges lined up against you. You're ugly. sitting in a jail cell. <laughs> like, it was really ugly. And here's the thing is that you had enough insight and awareness to say, if I go out here, like, somebody's going to try to rob me. Like, you knew this in advance. Like, what was your thought process? I was sick. It was, like, the most disgusting feeling ever in my life. It was, like, I knew that something was going to happen and I told myself I wish that he would rob me and I'll even say that some people like man I stabbed the shit off somebody mm -hmm. and I did I did what I said I was going to do and I got what I wished for so now I got what I wished for the power of intent that's the mind you know I kept asking for it. really I'm asking for it I'm like look I wish somebody would give me what I'm asking for and now I'm in this predicament where I'm looking at my charges like man first degree attempted murder like damn you know I'm facing life I'm in there for nine months man and now what I love the most reading now has to be put to use the right way. Because mm. now I'm mm. not reading any frivolous shit. I'm not, I'm not reading stuff that ain't going to help better me. Like, I need to read what I need to read to fix my life and fix the situation. Now, even though I had a lawyer, you know, with the case that I had, I still had to study and help him go through certain things to be able to be or, or make better use of my situation because it was ugly, man. All the way around the board, it was just an ugly case. So let me stop you right there. And I think this is so very critical for people that are watching the Rashad Mills show here on Awesome God Radio via uh, Instagram Live as well. My Instagram family, thank you so much for checking in. I think that you said something very powerful for especially my young brothers that are watching this show. Absolutely. Is that even in your worst situation, even in your darker days, there was a power in your mind, right, mm -hmm. that led you to further educate yourself. Absolutely. Like, because a lot of people, Alan, can get in these situations and literally shut it down, but there was something internally that clicked in you and said, I need to educate myself. And here's the thing that I was just blown away. You said not only educate myself, but you said educate and help your lawyer. Yeah, because I think a lot of times when people pay for a lawyer, whether it's a public defender or if it's private, they don't know your case like you know it. You know your case, mm -hmm. you know, so he's only advising and helping you with what you're trying to do. It's like even in real estate, you know, I can help you get a house and negotiate the deal, but you got to tell me what house it is that you want in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. This is your freedom. You're paying somebody to help you be free or help beat your situation. So, yeah. They're helping you do it by mm -hmm. finding case laws and these, this, that, and the third, but it's your life. 
you need to give him what needs to be said, and y'all got to work together to be able to help the situation at hand. He's just advising you on the best path to take to give you the best path of resistance to be able to beat your situation. So I worked hand in hand with him. He'll tell you, man, I would write him and call him. Even at times he wouldn't ask his like he would know I would call him. Like every day. He would he told me, look, Alan, you could call me anytime for any questions. Man, I'm on that jail phone. I'm calling him more than I'm calling my mom more than anybody. Right. I need to get out of here. Right. You know? And and during that, um What you know, gave you hope at that point? Family. Family. Uh my family, even though that was a dark it was dark. It was dark and and I know there was times where they was like, Man, <laughs> man, he really put himself in a tough one with this one. They didn't say that to me. They didn't give up on me. So they, they never say, wrote you off, you believe? Nah. Okay. Nah. And it was just like, that. What kept, that's what kept me going. Because there were times in there, you know, um, the, the the people that were in there, you know, we all was in a dark place. Like, I, they had me on a tier where people were facing the same type of stuff I was facing. And their demeanors were, they had gave up. You know, a lot of them. So it was like, man, they knew what they did. They like, oh, I got a public defender, man. I might just do 20. Well, some of them might be like, oh, man, you got to attempt to murder, man. At least try to do 10. You're, gonna, you're probably going to do about 10. I said, man, I ain't trying to do nothing. So why, <laughs> you get what, what I'm so why wouldn't you get to that point where you were the, to the point of acceptance? If it was 5 or 10, like, what led you to say, like, rebuke any time that you thought that you wouldn't have to do? I think even early on, um, I was still, not as much, of course, now, but I was still a power of thoughts. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, if you think something a certain way, you know, the, the universe will, will find a way if you can believe it enough. And it was just like, if I put myself in the mentality like, eh, I might just do 15 on this, then it's like, you're probably going to do 15 or more on that. You know, you're going to be not as uh, hyped to be able to work your file because it's like you basically are accepting defeat mm. to a degree. So it was like, in this type of situation where I just stabbed somebody who... Who I'm at Eastern Shore, Maryland, where you're not supposed to be breaking law there in the first place. This isn't Baltimore City. Like they will hang you out here. So I had to fight that. You know, um, thank God we had the money to collectively to get a lawyer. So I had a lawyer, um, as opposed to a lot of people who had private uh, public defenders. So when it was like when you when they seen me have a lawyer there, it was like wow, somebody could afford a lawyer. Like mm. that's a small poor town, you know, Somerset County. So for them to see that. You know, I was grateful that, you know, me and my family were able to be in a position to be able to have that. Mm-hmm. Um, so when did you get that break? Like, when did you get that big break? Well, I mean, the big break happened when they found out that in his, sorry, in, in his inventory sheet, in his inventory sheet, it was two bullets in his pocket. So when we seen that, I had to have my lawyer use that because that's all I had. And all the motion discovery that I had, everything was ugly. The only thing I seen was that... The guy who got stabbed and uh, my partner at the time, their stories were conflicting on certain areas. But that still was not enough to, to free me. It was just that he had bullets in his pocket. And even that wasn't enough to free me. We just had to use that on the cross-examination and hope for the best. Because that's all we did. Because I'm, I was going to probably do about... If I'd have got found guilty, because I took it to trial. You know, if you get found guilty on trial, a lot of times they give you the max. So, if you get found guilty on the first three, you're washed up. The first two carry life, and the third one carry thirty. At the time, I'm 22 years old. You get Woo. you get 30 years at 22 years old. You're gonna do at least, even on good behavior, you gotta do at least half. So you, if you wanna get best behavior, you're gonna do 15 years. But even that's pushing it. You're probably gonna do 18, 19, because you're gonna accumulate tickets over time. So you're gonna do about 18 years. You're 22. You come home at 40. I came home at 40, man. After what I did, that's if I didn't get found guilty on the first two, which carry life. I never came home. So fast forward, you go to court. Right, I you go to court. I cross examine him, and make his long story short, he get his words uh, messed up on the stand. He like freezes for like 15 seconds, and then he finally says something. I'm like, oh man, I might go home. This guy just froze in front of the tr- in front of the jury. Kind of find out fast forward, they give me 11 years. So 11 years, that still sounds bad. But in the state of Maryland, and you know, I studied, I studied that go back going back to education. I studied, and it shows that 25 percent of your time you could be eligible for parole. If your charges are considered non-violent. So even though I stabbed the guy, I got found guilty on all the non-violent charges, which I'm grateful for because I really, I don't even know how I really didn't get first degree assault. I'm grateful for it. But they got what's called in Maryland. They don't have self-defense in Maryland. It's called imperfect self-defense. So they gave me an imperfect self-defense case and gave me all misdemeanor charges. 
but they sent me to maximum security prison now Cumberland. So they sent me to the one of the worst prisons in Maryland, but they gave me the non-violent charges. So I guess that was their way of like, um, we're going to send you to the worst prison, but you'll get a pass if you stay out of it. So it was like a catch-22. You send me to the worst prison, but you give me misdemeanor charges. I'm in the worst prison. It's easy getting fights, people getting stabbed, all of that. So, you know, it was a war zone, but mm. I did what I had to do, you know? So now out of the 11 years you serve, how many on the 11? I served three and a half years out of that. Um, I went up for parole the first time. They pushed it back. But while I was in there, I would write the parole board on everything that I was doing. I wrote a journal every day, and I got that idea from my father to write and document every day of my life while I was in there. So even though I'm an author, I wrote two books. Man, I got pages of every day of my life that would be books to come. You know, for as my as I grow older and as I give excerpts of my life, I got all my journal entries. So, um, but yeah, I did three and a half years to answer your question, and I came home um, with a mentality of now studying and learning and reading the right things to help better my life when I get out. It wasn't no more just I'm trying to get out. It was I'm gonna get out and stay out, and I'm gonna help others do the same thing in their own little prisons. So here's the thing: I was gonna ask you, what was your first hustle as? You got out and you were a free man because I think this is so important and you just ah. kind of said it, get out and stay out. So kind of, that's like go so, get out and stay out and tell right. people the significance of that first hustle and then we'll talk about a little bit later how it's transitioned to a much bigger thing. Got you. So when I was in prison, it was a cold day. i never forget it. Cold like how it is now, but I was in a cell. Um, I told myself, man, I got to get out and stay out. So that's what I was, that was my, that was my, my workouts in the morning. I was telling myself, I got to get out and stay out, get mm -hmm. out and stay out. And it got catchy, so I called it Goso, G-O-A-S-O. And uh, I would write it on letters. You know, that was like my mantra to myself mm -hmm. to, to be, you know, better and overcome what I've been through. So I actually got the first hustle again. I got it from my father. I, I told him, I asked him what was his first hustle. And his first hustle was actually candy. When he was a child, he would go around and sell candy. So when I came home, they gave me a $50 prison check. I took that whole $50 prison check, and I bought $50 worth of candy. I got a bucket out of the garage. I put candy in the bucket, and I would literally would go to colleges. First time being Morgan State. Shout out to Morgan State for having me on that campus a lot. Um, and I would go around and say, hey, my name's Alan Upshur. I just came home from prison. Uh, I'm trying to start this movement called GOSO, Get Out and Stay Out. And I just want to motivate people to do things the right way and not the wrong way. I was a college student myself, and now I want to do things in a better light. You know, if you got a nickel, a dime, a quarter, anything to help push this movement, I'll give you a bag of candy in exchange. And that was my first hustle when I came home. How humbling was that from somebody that was in a college environment, right? Selling Making money, drugs, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, selling, selling weed mm -hmm. to now have a bucket of candy and Ooh. literally, no pun intended, like nickel and dime. That was, like, nickel, how that was nickel was that? and dime. It was definitely, it was definitely humbling. And it just made me remember where I was, you know, it was like. I was in college like these college students. That's why I, I gravitated to colleges because both times I was in college when I went to prison. And that's the time I think in a lot of people's lives where it's like you felt the most free. But those those years of my life that were college years, I was I spent them incarcerated, which is the irony of that. So it was like I could really touch them, I guess, a little more, I felt. But it was definitely humbling because it was just like, man, I lost it all. And they knew how I came to them. I looked them in their face like, man, I'm for real. Like, this is real. This is where I was, and this is what I'm trying to do. You know, and they would ask me about it, and I would tell them what, I, what I've been through. And it was like, after 30 days, man, I raised $1,500. And with that $1,500, I bought my own LLC. I bought um, a whole bunch of T-shirts. And now it's not candy no more. Now it's a physical T-shirt. I bought a trademark. So I learned this all in prison. I learned about an LLC in prison. I learned about how to trademark a, a logo in prison. So I started a business from what I learned in prison with the $1,500 that came from the $50 that the prison gave me. You know, so I just thought that was just like... So, so in essence, you were still hustling now. It was just the legal way. Exactly. So I, I flipped this candy into, in addition to, you know, I flipped it into an LLC. So now I have this legitimate business going. And then what happens from there? Uh, so the business started picking up and people started like really showing me love throughout the movement you know it was like it went from candy and then i would record it so people could see the recordings and they still on youtube to this day it's funny looking at them now um but i went from there to, to selling t-shirts t-shirts turned to hats and clothes and jackets um 
one of the, a surreal moment for me was when Remy Ma had came on from prison, mm -hmm. and Remy Ma had gave me a shout out, and she was like, "Shout out from Allen, um, from Baltimore, go so get out and stay out." You know, I can relate. And I still got the video on YouTube, and I was just like, "Damn, I got Remy Ma. She gave me a shout out. She was in prison. We was in prison around the same time, and she came home, and it was just cool to have her support my movement." Um, and it and was also, like, I saw in researching for this interview, I saw that Hill Harper. Sent you some love one day. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was cool, man. And Ravens, you know, some Ravens players. I had John Wall. He wore a hat. Um, so it was cool. I, I, I was getting love. And it was just, as it got slow, it was like the movement was picking up, but the money I was making was less. So now here I am. I'm like, I'm in a situation where, like, I, I can't make a living off of GoSo. It was like, I love the movement, but I'm not making a living off of it. So I started thinking, thinking crazy again. Like, man, maybe I should go back to the streets, you know, but... At that moment, it was like, you know what, let me humble myself and get a job. So I humbled myself, tried to sell cars. You know, I was selling cars, but the hours was just so long. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just like I couldn't do it. So I went back to let me try to get my real estate license again. And when I tried, they denied it. And then they denied it based on your record. Based off my record. Okay. Right. So be when they denied it, it has been about 18, going on 20 months I've been home at this time. I done spoke to about 10 different schools. I done spoke to about six, seven different churches, different events, and I documented everything because I believe in evidence. Like, you want to have evidence of everything that you do. So not knowing that I would need all that when I went in front of the real estate commission board and they said, Mr. Upshur, why should we give you your license? And what was your response to that? I looked at it just like when I was at trial. You know, when the, when the judge asked me for sentencing, you know, why should I go easy on you? What, what do you feel? You know, because they ask you about, you know, um, how do you feel about what happened? They give you a chance of remorse, basically. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of similar in that because it was about six guys and they all were staring at me like, why should we give you your real estate license? Why are you here appealing this decision? And at that moment, you know, everything that I said, you know, I talked about the mind, about how I've changed mentally before anything. You know, I didn't I don't just I'm not just saying I want this. I'm showing you proof why I want it, you know. Yes, I've been incarcerated. This is what I've learned since I've been incarcerated. Boom. This is who I spoke to in Baltimore City. Boom. This is what I've done um, business-wise in my life. Boom. LLC. You know, I'm showing them the LLC. I'm showing them the trademark. I'm showing them every school that I spoke to. So they're seeing everything that I spoke to. And I'm like, hey, look, I got a broker who's trying to do this. So I'm showing them evidence. And I'm, I'm showing them a paper trail of everything that I've done. And ultimately, when it was all said and done, they... It was like they just, they bowed down, basically. Like, this guy really wants it, and here's the proof. He's not just saying it. He's showing us evidence on why he wants it. They overturned my sentence, man. It was like, it was like one of the most happiest days, man, because it was like I didn't take real estate serious that first time, you know, and now I'm, I'm taking this, I'm taking this, I'm taking it serious, and they asking me why I'm taking it serious, and I'm showing them why I'm taking it serious, and they overturned it. And that was just like a, a, a proud moment because when he, when I got when I got the letter in the mail saying they denied it, I was with my mother. You know, my mother wrote me more than anybody wrote me when I was in prison, and um, she was we was devastated together over it. And it was like it had me angry thinking about going back to my past. But I read the letter again. Let me go reading, and it said at the bottom, uh, if you want to appeal this decision, we will give you a chance by law to give you a chance to appeal your decision. And I took that and I had to fight all over again like I was going to trial. You know, and that's how I carried it. I carried it like it was trial all over again, because it was. It was a trial of, of my career, of what I wanted to do. So when they overturned it and they gave it to me, it was like, man, I got to take this thing and run with it. You know, um, you know, shout out to Sean Wilson, shout out to Will Rogers. They'll tell you, man, when I was in Keller Williams' legacy, man, you know, I, I, man, I was in it like a man possessed, man. I'm up late nights every night, man. I wanted that. You know, you couldn't tell me nothing. Where I've been at, facing attempted murder. You know, been in this, been in the cell, fights, stabbings, some people get raped in, in Cumberland, Maryland, in maximum security prison. And you you about to tell me y'all just gave me my real estate license that I'm not gonna be successful at this? You crazy, man. After everything I've been through in my life, you telling me I can't take a real estate license and sell a house? You nuts. I'm gonna be one of the best at it. And that's how I carried it every single day. And I got rookie of the year. 
from Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Keller Williams, my first shit. Award winning. Actually, hold that thought. I just want to check in, Alan. I absolutely love the energy and the real estate <laughs> practitioner. She checks in via Instagram Live and says all facts. So to the people watching Instagram Live, I definitely appreciate you. Facebook Live, James, if you can scroll up. Good evening to Kim Neal, Tiffany Bonds. Thank you so much for always checking and being incredibly supportive. Nicole, thank you for what you do. The calling number, if you're watching uh, via Facebook Live, or even Instagram Live, if you want to speak to Alan, that number is eight seven seven. 4-7-9-4-4-7-3. Again, that number is 877-479-4473. So you get out of prison, you're denied you, your real estate license, and then you you have the opportunity to take the test again. Not even take it again, but to overturn Correct. Them, denying it. So you right. get the real estate license, right? Mm -hmm. So now this is sort of like the transitional phase, another transitional phase of Alan's life. Yes. So you mentioned that you were good at it, rookie of the year. And I think the last count that I had that you had sold over a hundred and thirty plus homes. Maybe that's it's a little higher now, but yeah, it's yeah, a little higher. Okay. Yeah, it's like uh, close to one fifty, so like one forty and some change. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. when you sit back and you think about going up in front of the judge for an attempted murder and potentially having your life bare minimum, it's just you saying it like bare <laughs> minimum, we're talking maybe twenty to twenty five years, and you mentioned yeah. you know returning to yeah. um, your freedom at the age of forty or forty five, right? And then you look where you're at now as an award-winning realtor, 100 and plus uh, 50 some homes being sold. Like, what, what, what is the thought process now when you wake up? Is it surreal for you? Um, it's, it's rarely. It, I would say more so when I'm out of town is when okay. it's most surreal. Um, but I, I daily, man, and, and I and I seen this from from Eric Thomas when he mm -hmm. said when Emmett Smith had won a Super Bowl, mm -hmm. and and I, and I can relate to it. Because, you know, not in the sense of a Super Bowl, but when he was in the gym, he was like, he was lifting weights and he was like, ah, I just won a Super Bowl. And he stopped for a second, took a deep breath, and he went back to working out again. You know, and that's how I feel. It was like, yeah, you know, I, I did that. I wrote two books, but it's like, you take your deep breath over it, but that ain't it, man. You know, I got a long way to go. It's like, all right, now it's time for book three. You saw the house, you saw 150 houses. Now it's time for 151. You know, it's like, mm. that's how you got, that's how I look at it. It's almost like, you know, uh, it, it, it's no, there's no finish line. Like the finish, a finish line to me is, it's, it's imaginary, man. There's no such thing as a finish line. Not for me. There is no finish line. You just, you just keep going, man. You keep going, you know? So, uh, so here's the interesting thing. And I, I just couldn't wait to bring this up because I think, um, the question I'm gonna ask you about next really um, summarizes like you come in full circle. So you get out, and even while you're there, right? Right. Doing push ups in the cell, maybe doing your dips, your sit ups, and you say, Man, I'm going to get out and stay out. I'm going to get out and stay out. So it's this power intent. And that's the first gym that people that are watching the Rashad Mill show that I really hope that they caught the power of intent, this intentional mm. thought. Mm. Get out and stay out. Get out and stay out. So you get out, and now you're selling candy out of a bucket, right? Out of a bucket. <laughs> so you make $50, and then you uh. transform that into a LLC. Correct. Go so get out and stay out. Yep. So now I want you to tell the people, if you don't mind, and I know of course, you won't, of course. what go so is now. So go so now is a mortgage company, and wow. even just thinking about it, it's like it's crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, actually, I'm in a position where um, a parent company, Home Mortgage Alliance, um, helped brand my own mortgage company when I got my mortgage license. So I'm in a position where you know. That's what I'm doing now. When people will ask me, and it just opens the door because the first thing people ask is like, what does GoSo mean? And it's like, oh, you know, I got an answer for them. So I, I, I daily go so it, it means get out and stay out. But, you know, the word itself that I came up with is more so like it's the mentality of overcoming anything in your life that was negative and using that negativity as your fuel. That is your fuel now to overcome whatever it is you want to accomplish. And in this case, it's for it's for home buyers. It's for mm -hmm. making sure that your credit's better. It's for understanding financial literacy better more than anything. You know, yeah, it's a mortgage company, but when we have when I have conversations with people now, as opposed to just helping them get a house, it's like, you know, once you get your house, it's not a matter of you losing that discipline and that focus on, you know that financial literacy that you learned, you just went this far to get your credit a certain way or save a certain way. 
you could take it a step further. This is just your first house. You know, I like to tell clients, like, you know, I'm going to see you again. This is just your first house. You know, this one might be your primary, but you'll have two, three more, and I'll see you when you get those two. You know, you'll be leaving them for your kids and your legacy, you know, and not even important than that. You know, sometimes I talk to them about, I give them my book when I see them, you know, because it's that legacy behind it. Mm. You know, the house is one thing, you know, helping, helping someone have or your, your children or your grandchildren leaving them with a house is one thing but leaving an institution is another you know i can leave you a house to my son or daughter but if i didn't leave him a blueprint or i didn't leave him a, a institution a, a better way of understanding credit or showing them that guy or that blueprint they take the house and it goes into foreclosure after i die in 10 years what good was the house Mm. So you got to have that institution behind that, that asset that you're leaving, in my, in my opinion. So I, I want to be big on people understanding that, yes, we can leave houses for our children. That's fine. But also, let's leave a blueprint. Let's leave an institutional. Uh, let's make institutions, you know, um, for our children. We don't like the school system. Let's work on making our own. You know, one of my goals before I die is I want to be in a position where I can create a financial school of entrepreneurship. You know, I want entrepreneurship to be taught at five or six or seven years old. Mm. We learning at LLCs at 35, 40 years old. Let's teach our children at eight or nine the importance of LLCs. Let's teach them about the importance of credit. You know, let's have more games that we play. I seen uh, Will Rogers, he had a game that he mm -hmm. was playing with his children about. Like, let's teach our children that early. Let's make it cool early. You know, one of my favorite games, two of my favorite games that my dad um, we played when I was a child was chess and monopoly chess and monopoly and here I am today at 31 years old still playing chess and monopoly I'm doing it not just on a on a on an actual game itself but I'm doing it with my life you know when I was in mm. prison I was playing chess you know I had to say what I had to say to the to the parole to, to, to get to where I needed to go you know now um now monopoly like I own multiple properties you know, I don't just have one. I'm playing Monopoly. I'm trying to get another one. I'm trying to get three more before the years. I'm playing Monopoly. So let's teach our children games that they can use in their lives so they can just be having fun with it. You know, I'm a mortgage and I'm having fun with it, man. Got you. you so know? we're really into the real estate world. And that leads me to my next question. Um, we just transitioned into 2020. A lot of people at the place that they want to secure home ownership for this year. For the people that are watching the Rashad Mill Show, Instagram Live, Facebook Live, what is the first step that you would advise somebody to do in terms of being ready to purchase a house? Because you mentioned financial literacy. So in your opinion, what is that first step that a person should take? really is mentally mentally you got to really mentally feel like you are ready for it because a lot of people will say hey you know i'm ready i'm ready to i'm ready to purchase a house so how do you question, get mentally ready well first thing is you would get all let's get all parties involved that will be involved in this process which you know um is it you is your boyfriend is your mom like who who's all going to be helping you through this process so the first thing you want to gather who's basically your accountability partners with this okay you know so if you want to if you want to purchase a house if you want to uh if that's what you want to do and you feel good about doing that let's mentally prepare you first you know let's get the people who are going to be doing this with you whether it's just you or, or not you let's get the blueprint together first so one of the things we do is when you miss to mentally prepare like you say is to get the accounting accountability people who are going to be helping you through this process mm -hmm. that's first you know second once we have that we want to know comfortability you know comfortability comes in you know budget you know comfortability comes when you know where you work at are you secure with that is that where you're going to stay so just getting th that paperwork together first you know driver's license social security card you know sometimes people don't have a social security card they got to get it so just mentally having that blueprint in front of you on what you need that blueprint so if you're mentally ready now let's get the right blueprint on what you need once we got exactly what you need, then we can actually qualify you based off of that. Are you ready to get your credit pulled? Why aren't you? What are some of the things you're worried about? Let's overcome fears. So, mm. which is still mental, you know? So mm -hmm. we get all that out the way first. We start mentally. Once we mentally say, okay, I'm ready. I'm, I'm understanding I got, my credit has to be pulled. I understand I got to get these papers. And now you take an action. So what are you doing with your time? You know, which goes into later on, I was telling you about to write another book. But mentally and how you're using your time to show that you're ready. So those are the two things that we start off with before we even do anything else. Your mind got to be there and you got to put your time into what you're saying that you're trying to do. Those two things. Wow. So you really take people through not just this financial process, but you really take people through it almost feel like this holistic process of being ready. And it starts with the mental. 
Correct, correct. And, and, and ideally, man, it is. Mm-hmm. It really is because you're somewhere that you that you are right now that you don't want to be mm-hmm. and you want to put yourself in a better position. Like, I was in prison. I didn't want to be in prison. So I had to mentally and put the time behind what I needed to do with the law library and talk to certain people to help me be in a position to be better. So all we're doing is putting ourselves mentally in a place where we are currently and where we want to be. So, of course, everything has to start mentally. Here, I'm going to read you something, um, and I just want your response to this. We're talking about this home ownership phase, right? Getting really um, mentally prepared to transition into something new. This is according to a survey by CNN. It's estimated that 68% of the people live paycheck to paycheck. For somebody that's been in the world of real estate, really transforming minds and getting them ready to move. Like, when you hear that, like, what do you think of that? Lack of discipline. It's a lack of discipline Um, Because a lot of times We live in paycheck to paycheck Because And it's a quote I'm going to add to that um, It's not how much you make It's how much you keep You know So a lot of times Because we have the means To be able to grab This money that we're getting It's not that Our bills are exactly What you know We're making That's not the case at all It's just that We have that access to capital And we don't have that That discipline And we don't have that discipline Because we didn't have The person that teach us Or Sometimes it's just not enough pain. It's not enough pain to be like, you know what? I can't use my whole entire check this month. Sometimes we don't learn to not use our whole check until it's a repossession of your car or uh, you get an eviction letter. So we don't want to keep learning through pain. You know, every time we live in paycheck to paycheck, we have to see that there's a better way if you don't live paycheck to paycheck. If you get $300 and you know your bills are only 50, you don't got to go spend $100 at the club and get something, you know, spend outside your means but if you don't see if you don't see that if, if you don't have accountability partners that's showing you a better way then you're going to keep doing it because a lot of times we're mm. doing what, what everybody else is doing the people that we talk to on the phone you know the five people you talk to in your daily conversation a lot of times four out of five of them are doing what you're doing you absolutely know? absolutely so You've been in the world. So what got you from the point that you was like, I'm a transition from being a realtor to going over to the world of loans? Like, what was that transition for you? Because you were wildly successful at one. Right. And then why did you kind of grab the um, One of them was because I I started realizing that how I was spending my money wasn't, it wasn't the best way. Um, I would get, I would get real estate commission checks and I would go to the casino, man. And it's times where I didn't got, a five thousand dollar commission check, and I would take the whole five thousand to the casino, trying to make ten out of it. And there's times where I might have got lucky and made some money and been happy. And there's times where I had a tough deal that I just took forty five days of my life to close. Forty five days, and I would go to the casino and blow all of it in a matter of like twenty minutes. And I felt disgusted. And I think the only way people learn is is through disgust, man. Or a, mm. a large amount of pain, you know. So it took me times where, you know, and not, and not just the casino. There are other things, you know. Sometimes traveling and spending more money, you know, than than, than I needed to, um, and then realizing like, man, I'm, I'm I'm about to be in my 30s. I I got these goals that I want to accomplish, and why is it taking a little longer than than it should? Because I made decisions like that. Now, granted, I'm glad I caught them early, and it wasn't too detrimental, you know, but. One of the reasons why is I just had to come to, to a conclusion with myself because couldn't nobody else tell me. Mm-hmm. I had to be like, you know what? How I'm spending this money, man, this is stupid. Like, I'm disgusted at myself. And it just got to the point where I reached a, a place of disgust. Like, I'm making the money, and I would tell myself, man, I'll make that back on my next deal. It was like, man, nah. I had to just have a recollection with myself. Like, man, this is like, like an addict. What I'm doing was no different than somebody mm. you know on drugs mm. or, or or have a problem or, or, or fiending you know it was like how we were spending money it was equivalent to somebody who was fiending off of drugs you know so it was like man i had a problem i had to come to conclusion and, and talk to people that i love like you know what i need to learn about money because what i'm doing this is not what i'm supposed to be doing with my money and it's like yeah i'm making the money but how i'm spending it Man, that's a problem, man, and I and I I got a problem, and I and, I, and I'm seeking help, so I seeked help, and one of the ways I seeked help was you know reaching out to my uncle, reaching out to my dad, and I told him how I wanted to actually study and and learn money, and as I was studying and learning money, man, I got 
like I fell in love with all the different ways that you can what you can do with your money, how your money can make money and learn the assets. And it was just like, wow, like I can do this. And it was just like as time went by, like every day in conversation, it's just like I'm thinking about different ways of how I could turn a dollar into two as opposed to me using my physical body. You know, now even though being a realtor is not a lot of physical work, mm -hmm. but it was like you would hear the cliches like make money in your sleep. You know, so it was yeah. like I wanted to make money in my sleep. I got tired of being in a position where, you know, I got to keep doing every single thing and get money that way. So it was like, man, I can get rental property. So then I got a rental property, and that's money that can come in for me. Um, having stocks and seeing how stocks are doing. Like I got stock in Visa, and Visa's been, been rising lately, and Visa's making money for me because I've put it in originally. You know, um, even human capital, like me being a mortgage lender now, um, I got a team of realtors, and I will give them the lead. I may not make as much, but they work in it. You know, they mm -hmm. happy because they're getting their money, and I'm happy because I'm getting, in a sense, like passive income. Because I know leads are going to come to me, and I'm demeaning them out. So it's like, now it's less work. It's more time I can relax. It's, it's less stress on the brain because stress will kill you. And it's like I'm finding different ways to use capital and make it work for me, you know, as opposed to me trying to do all the labor and, and, and hope in exchange to get money back, you know. Like, I get $100 right now. I'm putting 80 up. And 20 I'm just going to try to live off of it. You know, mm. um, I'm going more to the grocery store now. I'm not trying to go out to eat a whole, whole lot now. So I'm going to the grocery store and I'm really like budgeting, like, oh, okay, boom, this will last for this, this will do that. And it's like I'm looking and measuring because uh, a, a guy of mine, um, a, good, uh, a good partner of mine, he made a quote and he said, if it's not, um, he said, if it's not measured, it's not managed. So if, if you can't measure this of what you do, that means you're out of control, it's not managed. And that goes with your money. That goes with your life. So it was like your, mm. goal, your goals. Like if you're not measuring your goals, it's like where's the management at? Adam? You know, mm. you're saying you want to do this, but if it's not measured, it's not – you're all over the place. And the same thing with your money. If you don't know what you're doing with your money when you get it and it's not measured, it's not managed. So let me jump in and ask this quick question. Do you see that it has been an increase in particularly the African-American community where not just talking about home ownership but owning property, literally what you said – making money while you sleep do you see that there has been a um a change in the mindset because i see more young brothers and sisters talking about having rental properties having um you know money in stocks and things of that nature do you think as a whole meaning as an entire community that we are gradually getting better in that regard i do i do and i also see that there are more I see, i'm noticing that there's more realtors now and i love it um and i think part of it is because they know the money can be made in entrepreneurship like that Cause I love it, man. Like even within this four years when I was a realtor and, and how I've seen it become more, you know, it's almost like it's trendy, but it's a good trend. We need more of the good trends, you know? So I think we need to take that, capitalize it. Rental properties is one way, but just even having, just understanding that that's not the only way, but to make other assets trendy, like owning franchises, you know, there was a, I, I can't remember the exact numbers on it, but I was looking at, and I got some advice about a smoothie King, a guy out um, Miami here put, he had put $4,000 out of his own money. He got a loan for $16,000 and that smoothie King within like, nine years is now worth 1.5 million dollars all off of his four thousand dollar investment that he used is now worth and he sold it for 1.5 million you know all because it was an asset that he purchased he put his money up you know think about it. we got student loans that's 30 40 50 thousand dollars that we owe <laughs> this guy put four thousand dollars out of his money and and it it was a sixteen thousand dollar loan that he's paying every month but in eight nine years he made a million dollars that's we need to make that type of stuff trendy, you know. So it's like we we buy cars all cash at the auction for nine thousand, you know, mm. ten thousand. You know, we taking out tax money. We buy Louis Louis Vuitton bags, you know, stuff that, you know, we're not making no money off of that. But interestingly you know? enough, Alan, it goes back to what you said, and it's all mindset. Like it's all Correct. mindset. If I can buy a five thousand dollar bag, that I can't take that five thousand dollars and put it into something that's considered an asset and not a liability. So it goes back to what you said. It's all mindset. Right, right. Um, it's accountability, man. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I really want to get, um, I want to get all, 
as many of the black lenders that I know, like the Malcolm Cranes and, uh, you know, not even just black lenders, but I want to get a collective pool of, of, of mortgage lenders. And we collectively don't look at it as competition because a lot of times when you see home buyer seminars, you might have like one lender, one realtor, and that's cool. You know, it brings a home buyer seminar feel to it. But I feel like it should be like a group of us, mm -hmm. you know, because certain people gravitate to certain people. Like some people, they may not like my style as a mortgage lender, but they might like an older person. But if we both together doing a, a, a collab, breakfast or collab whatever with how he views his clients at his age at 40 his you know philosophies on how to save money and credit he may not look at it as me as an entrepreneur who's talking about facebook boost post ads he may talk about flyers i'm talking about facebook boost he might talk about instagram i might be talking about snapchat so i just feel like collectively mm. we should have like at least on the lender side like let's collectively do something all together because we'll grab our own different audience and then we can see what, you know, his clientele may be based off of this one. I got a guy in my office, he Hispanic, and I, I love, you know, we have little conversations from time to time and I just like to see how his the, the audience, the people that he brings into the office and how his conversations go. It, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. You know, we in the same office where we got a two totally different type of, you know, clientele base. And it's like collectively bringing all that together, man. You know, um, I, I just want to be the mortgage lender that makes it trending and cool to be able to save money and buy assets and have franchises. That's that's kind of like my thing now. Um, since I, I did it more so as a realtor, like I used to love, you know, taking the settlement pictures and then I seen more people doing it and it was cool. Like that's what realtors do, you know, so I want mortgage lenders to, you know, really get more in depth on not just helping them get qualified for a house, but like really after the deal was done, like, hey, look, you know, where your credit utilization at? You know, what are you trying to do next? Mm. Like, you know, remember if you got at least ten, they say between eight to ten thousand dollars a year if you save is a good amount to put towards an asset. How many of us are doing it? You know, so to be able to be in a position where we make saving money cool to buy assets and let, let our money work for ourselves. So. Wow. Thank you so much for joining me on the Rashad Mill Show. To everybody who tuned in, Facebook Live, Ricky Carter Jr., uh, Clifton Bright, my good brother Tony. Um, James, you can scroll up to everybody that's checking in via the Rashad Mill Show Instagram Live. I certainly appreciate you. There have been so many gems um, from Alan Upshur, loan originator, licensed realtor, actor, um, <laughs> author, right, from Prison of yep. Paradise. Yep. And this is available on Amazon.com. Yes. You have your second book, right? Yeah, that's actually on there, too. It's called Stay Out of the Bullshit. It's a, poem, it's a uh, motivational poem book. It's all poems. Um, my favorite poet is Langston Hughes, so that's who I inspired so me to write two time that. author working on the third one just uh just as i predicted very motivational innovate motivational informational i should say man your story is incredible your energy level is incredible and i think number one that you have a heart for the people and i think Definitely. me just listening to everything that you said um you dropped a lot of gems but the thing that i'm going to take away from it was the number one thing that you talked about and that's that power of intention yes. and i think that if you intend to be something whether it's good bad or indifferent you want to be that exact thing yes so everything about your story and i've already known the story but i was again and just captivated again by listening to it is that you were so intentional about everything. You were intentional about educating yourself. You were intentional about getting out and staying out. You were intentional about flipping everything. And everything that you've done has started with the power of the mind and being intentional. So what I'm going to do, Alan, I'm going to give you two minutes and I just want you to talk to any brother, sister out there, particularly some of our brothers in Baltimore that may have just been transitioning from a jail or a prison cell and they're watching you but they're still in a little bit of doubt. And can they do it? Can they get out and stay out? So I want you to have the final words um, to go ahead and, and encourage them. And then I want you to take 30 seconds and let people know how they can get in contact with you as well. Definitely. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is mentorship. Mentorship. We can't we can't do it all, all by ourselves. And a lot of times I think pride gets in the way. You know, we don't want to ask for help. We don't want to seek for help, even though we know internally that we need it. Mm -hmm. We know, we know we need the help. We look in the mirror we get, and we look at ourselves like we need help, but we don't want to tell anybody that we need help. So to have a mentor who can relate to you, not just anybody, it got to be somebody who y'all have a, a common uh, struggle or a common pain because pain is universal, man. We all feel pain. So that pain with your mentor, we got to feel that together collectively. And sometimes 
it's okay to have more than one mentor. I have multiple mentors. So don't think it's just one person that if you can't get in touch with him, all my mentors not answering the phone, he can't help me. So I think the takeaway is that when we're going through these struggles, man, to have mentors because mentors can hold us accountable and we can hold them accountable. So that's the takeaway that I want brothers to know that when you're going through struggle, that you're not alone with it. Someone out there who's been through what you've been through is in a better spot. You got to find them at all costs and make them a mentor and they'll seek you as a student and hold each other accountable, man. How can people get in contact with you, Alan? Um, you can contact me a lot of different ways. One of them is through Facebook. Uh, just go to my name, Alan J. Upshur. I'm um, also on Instagram. Instagram, just put Alan Upshur, A-L-A-N-U-P-S-H-U-R. Um, no J for, the, for that. Um, then I'll get my direct number. Um, it's 410-844-1930. Again, my direct number is 410-844-1930. Alan, you've been a blessing to my life. I know you've blessed people that are watching the Rashad Mills Show, Awesome God Radio, Facebook Live. I'm bringing in my Instagram family as well. You've been certainly a blessing to everybody else. Uh, man, just keep doing what you're doing, making positive Got change it. in the community, man, and allowing people to hear your story as much as possible because I think it needs to be heard. My man, I appreciate you greatly. Got it, man. Next week, guys, I'll be back with Marvin McKenzie, McKenzie Jr., all the work he's doing in the community here in Baltimore as a pastor and just working with the young people. So thank you so much for tuning in to the Rashad Mill Show every Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Stay tuned on Awesome God Radio, Women in Business International coming up shortly. I love you guys, and I'll see you next week.